The year is 1897 AD, the 30th year of the Meiji era. But this is not the usual era that we know of. This era is an alternate timeline in human history and is plagued with the supernatural. Our main character Tsugaru Shinuchi is a specialist in handling these abnormalities and makes his living exterminating yokai in theatrical performances. Ayakashi and yokai are found everywhere in this world, posing a menace to society. Due to westernization, a large-scale organized extermination effort is made in Tokyo, aimed to cleanse the place from these monsters. They call this the Great Purge. The operation is successful, at least at face value. Once safety is guaranteed again, humans have decided to create entertainment out of lesser-known monsters who were lucky to avoid the extermination. One would think this is a ridiculous setup, maybe even a form of superiority over these dangerous creatures. But humans are humans. They can always find ways to make their lives a farce. In a quiet town in Tokyo, people gather to witness an entertainment show. A shockerer or a three-toed demon is hissing at a man. It has lots of blood on its body and it's raging to claw at its enemy. The man with blue markings all over his body simply looks at the monster like it's not worth his attention. The demon attacks, but the man leans backward and gives the shockero a fatal kick. The audience roars with delight as the monster takes its last breath. The man is known as the Oni Slayer. He's contracted by a troop leader who runs the town theatre that includes nightly entertainment of purging monsters. His only job is to make killing demons entertaining. This has been his routine since he became a part of this troop. Some members of the troop are monsters like the Rokura Kubi and they don't like the Oni Slayer. But he's not bothered by it. In fact, he almost doesn't get bothered by anything at all. Except for the apparition of a woman in a maid uniform. Lately, he's been seeing visions. Whether it indicates that his life is almost at its end, or he's simply losing his mind, he's not sure. During the day, he walks along the streets of the town. It's one of the poor places in the country, with people making an everyday habit of fighting each other for food. Most of them know the Oni Slayer. Kids follow him as a dare, and as soon as he turns around, they will run on their little feet. Sometimes he'll try to help the villagers purge some demon-looking creatures. Just like now, where he spots a group of people trying to banish a forlorn and feral cat. The Oni Slayer knows it's only an ordinary feline, but for the gullible and ignorant townspeople, any creature that hisses at them are all demons. He lets the cat escape and, with a slight hint of sarcasm, apologizes for failing to finish the monster. Then he sees the vision again. He gets the feeling that he'll know his stalker very soon. Later that night, he feels incredulous at fate's twisted joke. The cat he saved earlier has become a bacchanico and he must exterminate it to entertain their patrons. After doing his job, he gets paid then goes to his room to rest. He's aware that his stalker is inside the house. The maid that has been following him peeks first to make sure her prospect is in there, but when she pushes aside the curtains, she is baffled to find the small room empty. She walks to the back door to go outside. She retrieves what looks like a bird cage covered in cloth and a long, slender object that's also covered in cloth strips. That's when the Oni Slayer decides to greet his stalker. The maid, with her stoic face and straight posture, is far from what the Slayer is expecting, which makes it all the more interesting. He reaches for the birdcage, but before his hand can touch it, the maid slaps his hand hard. She jumps away from him. She sets down the birdcage and gets the long object from her back. It turns out to be a bayonet upon unwrapping. The Oni Slayer gets ready, his bottle of beer ready in his hand. In a quick succession of moves, he gets behind the maid and pours the contents of the bottle into the rifle's muzzle, rendering it useless. But the blade is still a potent weapon. What follows is a fierce battle between the Oni Slayer and the maid. He has to shake his head to clear his slight drunkenness, because it's the first time in a long time that he fought a capable fighter. She throws her bayonet at him, which he evades, but it gives an opening for her to kick him. Then she quickly retrieves her weapon and charges at him. He waits for the right time to step on the weapon before pinning the maid on the ground. The maid suddenly speaks, calling him the Oni Slayer and apologizing for this rude introduction. In her defense, this altercation only happened because he tried to touch the birdcage. When the maid looks back at him, he is surprised to realize she's not the one speaking. Or is it simply ventriloquism? The voice keeps on talking even though the maid hasn't opened her mouth. The voice says her trip to Tokyo to find him has been worth it. The Slayer isn't going to pay any attention when the voice says he doesn't have much longer to live. 
It baffles him further when the voice knows exactly what he is. A hybrid. Half Oni and half human. He touches the mark on his face that extends to his whole body. As the voice keeps on talking about his condition, he gets flashes of traumatic memories that have made him into this kind of abomination. His hands and feet were chained to the table as he screamed in pain. An old man looked at him, satisfied with his suffering, clutching a cane in his hand with an initial M carved at the handle. The Slayer returns to the present when the voice offers him a deal. The voice knows that he has a short lifespan because every time he uses his powers at the theatre, the Oni inside him slowly takes over his body. The voice says she can extend his life if only he can grant her her wish. The maid reveals what's inside the cage, just as the voice says she wants to be killed by him. The Slayer is surprised to find that the birdcage contains a talking, severed head of a girl to which the voice belongs. It has a beautiful face with shrewd eyes. The long hair is coiled around her neck. There's no sign of deterioration on the head. In fact, it looks as healthy as any head attached to a living body. At that point, the Slayer knows he's talking to a legit immortal human being. The girl introduces herself as Aya Rindu and the maid as Shizuku Hasei. The Slayer thinks immortals are wrinkly old men. That's why it's a surprise to see a young, although bodiless one. Aya chides him, saying that she's still a human, although she stopped aging at the age of 14 and lived on for 947 years. Immortals are known to have the capacity for regeneration, so he wonders why she still hasn't got a body. Aya decides to relay her story to the Slayer. Six months ago, someone beheaded Aya and took her body. She couldn't see the perpetrator's face because of a mask. But she saw the boss, a foreigner, an old man clutching a cane. Shizuku was severely wounded by the incident, but she came through and took care of her mistress. She wasn't dead because there was a flaw in her beheading. If there's one thing that can fatally injure or kill an immortal, it's an oni, a pure-blooded one. But Aya is still alive despite not being able to regenerate. This implies that the perpetrator is a hybrid oni as well. When oni blood is mixed with others, it also dilutes the oni's powers. The reason Aya wants the Slayer to end her is because his Oni side is becoming more pronounced as days go by. This means that given enough time, he can finish her with his Oni powers. At that point, the show for the night ends. The Slayer invites Aya and Shizuku to take a walk, or else the troop leader will force them to join his crew. He eventually introduces himself properly as Tsugaru Shinuchi. Aya comments that Tsugaru appears to want to end his life, yet it's obvious that he still wants to live. When she elaborates further, she says that he keeps working in the theatre and using his Oni powers. In time, this will consume him completely, ending his life. Her maid, Shizuku, could have easily taken him. It should have been an easy kill, but he fought back, defending himself from harm. His words and his actions seem to be contradicting. So, Tsugaru explains his side as he kneels at the lifeless body of the cat he saw earlier. What Aya said is true. If he keeps using his powers, one day he'll go berserk and become a monster himself necessitating the authority to finish him. That's what he's always wanted ever since he became accursed with demon blood. But since he's working with the theatre, why not make the last moments of his life dramatic? Once he becomes a full-fledged monster, the Ayakashi he kills on stage won't be enough. He'll turn towards the audience, and then he'll let them experience the hell that entertains them. It would be fun to see the terror on their faces, and he wonders how many he can devour before he himself gets terminated. After all, his presence will not matter because he's a monster himself. But since Aya has offered him to extend his life, his plans have changed. Speaking of the deal, the girl prompts him about when he can end her. To Aya's surprise, Tsugaru refuses to do her bidding. Instead, he changes the terms of the deal. Why not let her extend his life so she can look for the ones who took her body? Tsugaru's instincts tell him that Aya has a plan on how she can reattach her body once she finds it. Through her immortality, surely she must have stored vast knowledge in her severed head. Plus, he thinks that the boss of the perpetrator who took her body must be the same as the one who experimented on him. And it turns out he's right. Aya knows the mastermind is in Europe, and she has an idea of how she can return to her original body. The only reason she wants to end it is because she can't do much with only her head. Her stoic maid will always follow her orders, no matter what. Impressed with Tsugaru's reasoning, Aya orders Shizuku to let her out. She accepts the new terms of the deal. She'll extend his life, and he'll go with them to Europe to retrieve her body. As the first payment, 
Aya tells him that the only way to extend his life is for him to consume a part of her. Not her eyes or brain, but sweat or tears or mucus, or, the more favourable one, her saliva. Tsugaru agrees with this. He gently takes Aya's head, while Shizuku shows a bit of annoyance at this deal. Then he raises Aya's head high up, as if he's toasting a goblet and about to drink the elixir of life. Then, he brings it down to kiss her lips. Now that's taking the phrase, seal it with a kiss, to a whole new level. Previously, Aya Rindo and her maid Shizuku Hasei have travelled to feudal Japan to look for the one called the Oni Slayer, who they found was our protagonist, Tsugaru Shinuchi, a half-human and half-oni. A deal has been set between them. Aya will extend Tsugaru's life. In exchange, Tsugaru will help Aya get her body back from the perpetrators who beheaded her. And that deal has been sealed with a kiss. Now we continue our story one year after the aforementioned events. We find ourselves in Givien, France at the Vague de Folie Mansion. The building looks dark and abandoned. With the mysterious forest as its background, one can only feel uneasy looking at it. But it's not desolate. A family is residing there, although they're not what a normal human family would be. The father and son are currently hunting in the nearby woods. Jean Duchet Godard uses a rifle to hunt a stag. When he misses, he lets out a sigh. He then drops the gun and chases after the animal. The stag runs quite fast, but Godard runs faster. After all, it's in his genes to hunt skillfully after his prey. When he catches the animal, he hauls it on his shoulder and goes back to his waiting son, Raoul. The kid asks his father why he needs to use the rifle when it's useless against his hunting skills. Goddard simply says it's to show everyone that they can blend in with humans. The mayor has gifted him the weapon, so he's using it as an appreciation. But Raoul thinks otherwise. Not all humans are accepting their integration into society, especially after Count Dracula got taken out. Many vampire hunters are still after them, just like the recent one who tried to kill them with a silver stake. Goddard turns to his son and emphasises that they have to get along with humanity, whether they like it or not. When they arrive at their home, Raoul asks why his father keeps the silver stake. Goddard says that it's safer for them to keep it, so their enemies will have less ammunition against them, but he's made sure to secure it in their storage room. Just as he walks toward the said room, Goddard kicks a wrecked padlock. When he looks at the door of the storage room, the chains are dangling from the handles. He opens the door and looks inside. Nothing seems to be misplaced except for the silver stake, which is now drenched in blood. Vampire blood. Immediately, he instructs Raoul to stay by his side at all times. He entwines the chains into the door handles, then calls out for his family members. The first to appear is Claude, his eldest son, who asks what's going on. Next is the family butler, Alfred, who says that he hasn't noticed anything strange since he's been in his office the whole time. Claude also reports that Charlotte, the youngest sibling, is with Giselle in the laundry room. They've been so loud all the time, there's almost no need to check on them. Then, realisation strikes as Goddard thinks about his wife. He runs to her room without a word. He hesitates by the door before opening it. It's dim inside and the only illumination comes from Alfred's candle. An empty bottle rattles on the floor as he kicks it. A bloodied coat is neatly folded beside the chair. When he goes around, he is shocked at what he's found. His wife, Hannah, is sitting on the chair. Her face is serene, with her eyes closed and her mouth formed into a small smile. She may have been sleeping, except for the noticeable dark hole in her chest, where blood is spilling out, pooling on her feet to look like a blooming red rose. Hannah is dead. This incident makes the headlines of newspapers the next day. Words like, Lady Wife of Lord Goddard Murdered, A Work of a Vampire Hunter, and first murder among human allies splash across the paper. In Western countries, a select type of monsters have been deemed human allies and are therefore given special protection and privileges by the local government. However, not all humans agree with this arrangement. Some extremists will go far to eradicate the monsters, even the ones that are innocent by all accounts. This is the hypothesis of media men that are now gathered in front of the mansion. A young journalist tries to defend Lord Goddard, saying he's written an oath to never drink human blood. But one can never be too dependent on these oaths, especially ones that are signed by monsters. Lord Goddard appears in his pristine suit. He needs to go to the judge to discuss matters about the incident. As they have always been, media men start peppering the vampire with questions while crowding him. Goddard can't help but show a bit of his irritation, so these men will back off. The young journalist named Annie Kerber states that the investigation is still ongoing. 
but this only spurred his irritation. He says the case is as good as dropped and the police are only saying that to maintain a good image. Goddard also says that he and his family have been doing their best to assimilate with humanity and yet this is the treatment they get. He instructs Annie to write down that social discrimination towards the human allies is still prevailing and this makes him extremely resentful. When the young journalist asks what he's going to do next, Goddard says he's going to hire detectives that specialize in monster cases. Their names are Aya Rindo and Sugaru Shinuchi. Annie gets excited because finally the infamous cage user is coming to town. Indeed, later that night, the said detectives are traveling along the bumpy country roads. Sugaru tells the coachman to hurry toward their destination but also asks him if he can make the journey less bumpy. His mistress is about to hurl, he says. Aya chides Sugaru to stop harassing the coachman. Besides, she can't even hurl. With that, the two chuckle together while Shizuku is as stoic as ever. The coachman peeks inside the carriage and wonders who owns the female voice if the maid is not even speaking. One year after they sealed the deal, Aya Rindo, Shizuku Hase and Sugaru Shinuchi have been traveling to Europe to look for the man who beheaded Aya. To fund their journey, they pose themselves as detectives. Due to Aya's prodigious intellect despite being a severed head, the little trio has become known throughout Europe, especially among the dignified monster communities. And part of their act is the image of Sugaru holding the birdcage while Aya solves the case. Many people believe something inhuman or demonic is inside the cage. This is how they earned the moniker Cage User. Eventually, they arrive in front of the mansion. The coachman charges them three francs for the journey, including the drive back to town. Suguru tries to haggle the price, but eventually they both settle for two francs. Suguru says that the payment will come from Lord Goddard after they're done with their work here. For some unknown reason, the coachman enters the mansion crying and relieved. Sugaru, in his easygoing demeanor, asks his client if he can provide a room for the coachman so he can rest for the journey tomorrow. Goddard, even though he's confused, accepts the request. Then he greets his guest, along with his sons Claude and Raoul. He can identify Sugaru as the cage holder since he's holding the covered birdcage. So the maid at the back carrying two luggages must be Aya Rindo. But when Aya speaks, and the maid is not opening her mouth, Goddard can't help but be confused. Even his sons are looking at each other. Who owns the female voice that is supposed to be Aya Rindo? The maid is led by Alfred to their rooms. Sugaru notices the confusion on their clients' faces. He smiles because this situation never gets old. He introduces the maid as Shizuku, which makes Goddard more baffled. It seems like even though he researched the cage user, some finer details were left out. Aya is not surprised. All the people who have seen her can't seem to have the courage to share one important detail about her. After all, who would believe them if they say that Ayarindo is a talking severed head? Sugaru lifts the cover of the cage and presents it to their clients, eliciting horrified yelps from all of them. Aya, with all of her dignified head, introduces herself again. After allowing herself a short moment to enjoy their reactions, she goes straight to business. She asks Goddard to recall all the things that have led to him finding his wife and the subsequent events that followed, with all details included. Goddard obliges her while they walk toward the room. He confirms that Lady Hannah used to be a human. He also adds that there are four of them in the family, excluding his dead wife now and two human servants living in the mansion. His wife used to fix anything antique. Sounds of metal and wood mallets would resonate all over the house when she was still alive. That's why he panicked when he didn't hear them that night. The crime scene has been preserved, making it possible for Aya to study the place with the help of Tugaru. She checks the chair, as well as the bottle of holy water found on the floor. She notes that the top part of the backrest is wet with the holy water. That's why Goddard doesn't touch it. He gives them a picture of his wife taken just after the discovery. Aya can see the wound and the blood that flowed from it. She also takes note of Hannah's serene face, because vampire corpses disintegrate rapidly after death, they had to bury her right after. Aya inquires as well about the silver stake kept in the storage room. Goddard confirms to her that when vampires touch silver, their regeneration abilities weaken. It will take at least a week to heal the wound caused by silver. But if any other weapon is used against them, they heal instantly. He adds that the hunter who used it before held the stake barehanded. As for the holy water, it seems like after stabbing Hannah with the stake, the culprit poured the liquid on her. 
but since she's already dead, her vampire skin had no reaction to it. After inspecting all angles and scenarios, Aya comes up with seven problems related to the timeline of the crime. She asks Sugaru to lift a finger every time he enumerates the problem. First, it's strange that Lady Hannah never noticed the murderer, despite her heightened sense as a vampire. Second, it's baffling why the suspect chose to attack at night when everyone knows vampires are more vulnerable at day. Third, the culprit left the bottle of holy water which could be used as evidence. It's clear that the coat was used to avoid blood splatter, but why leave the bottle behind? Fourth, the murderer knows where the silver stake is kept, where Hannah's room is, and the time she's napping, implying a knowledge of the layout of the mansion and the activities of its occupants. Fifth, it's strange why the culprit bothered to return the stake to the storage room. When Aya is about to point out the sixth and seventh problems, Sugaru says he has no more fingers to lift as his other hand is holding the cage. Aya tells him to use his tongue and foot, so Sugaru uses them and looks like a creepy clown without the red nose. He accidentally scares Charlotte off, who happens to check on them at that time. Enough fooling around, Aya says, and Sugaru puts his foot down. From the last episode, we're left with a cliffhanger when Aya Rindo enumerates five out of the seven problems she encountered upon analysing the murder of Lady Hannah, the wife of Lord Goddard. But there's no need to rush the truth. In due time, it will reveal itself, as it always does. The Goddard family, together with their detective guests, the coachman and the butler Alfred, takes their meal in the dining hall. The sons, Claude and Raoul, are not yet convinced regarding the capability of Aya and Sugaru in solving their mother's murder. To them, these so-called detectives look more like con men who'll double-cross them at any time. To impose their reputation, Aya decides to show them a bit of her deductive reasoning skills by focusing on their coachman, Mark. Just by looking at his clothes and his overall appearance, Aya succinctly concludes that Mark used to be a drunkard. But his wife has berated him to stop his vice. His clothes, despite being worn out, show deliberate care that a wife can only do for her beloved husband. Mark cries after realising his shortcomings, although another good reason can be that a severed head is lecturing him about appreciating his wife more. Claude is impressed by this. He remembers another famous London-based detective going by the name of Sherlock Holmes. Aya knows him as well, but she prefers not to meet him at all. After the meal, Aya proceeds with checking the alibis of the mansion's inhabitants, as well as going over the timeline of events. Going over the details will address both the obvious and the speculative factors of the case. On the day of the incident, the Goddards had their midday lunch at midnight, lasting for about 30 minutes. And then, an hour later, Hannah's body was discovered. Goddard says his wife told him she would be in her room for a nap. After this, he went to the study room to talk with Claude about some business matters. Charlotte was also with them, playing with her dollhouse. After one o'clock, the three left the study and separated in the hall. The father went to the storage room to prepare for hunting, while the siblings went to their rooms. When Goddard left the mansion to hunt, his youngest son Raoul came to him and asked if he could come with him, which he allowed. Aya then asks Claude for his alibi between one o'clock and 1.30 a.m., he says he stayed in his room until the body's discovery. Charlotte was pestering him to sing her a song, so when the maid, Giselle, came after cleaning the kitchen and the dining hall, he let his younger sister go with her. The maid says she was with Charlotte the whole time doing laundry, except for a minute or two when she went to the bathroom. As for the butler, Alfred, he says he stayed in his office after the meal to deal with paperwork. When Aya asks Raoul for his alibi, the younger son shows irritation at being suspected, but he eventually says he stayed in his room after the meal as well, up until when he went to his father to accompany him for his hunt. Aya also asks Claude and Alfred if they heard any suspicious sounds, to which the two say they heard nothing. From the statements, Aya states that the crime may have happened between 1 o'clock to 1.30 a.m. while Goddard was hunting, and only two among the family members have no solid alibis within the said time frame, Claude and Alfred. Goddard strongly objects to the implication that a member of his family can do such a horrific deed. But Aya is firm that the culprit is not an outsider, or else nothing about the crime scene will make sense. Their exchange only ends when Charlotte walks out, distressed about her mother's murder. After this rather glum dinner, Aya, Tsugaru and Shizuku walk around the mansion to get to know the interior. The severed head instructs her maid to keep a close eye on the servants, 
while she and Sugaru will accompany Goddard in the forest. To Aya, there's still a missing piece to the puzzle. As long as she doesn't have it, she'll be inclined to believe what the murderer intends for them. While they walk along the forest path, Goddard gives in to his curiosity and asks Sugaru and Aya about the existence of a so-called immortal. Aya confirms this and adds that only an oni, or a demon in their language, can end their eternity. But it doesn't mean that a demon is impervious to mundane attacks. They can still be fatally wounded by gunshots. Suguru kind of confirms that they are the entities Goddard is asking about. The vampire is astonished to realize he's met the creatures he only heard in his childhood stories. But before he can say anything, an arrow hits his neck. Goddard immediately runs after the vampire hunter and pins him on the ground. He's ready to believe this human was the one who finished his wife, but Aya stops him from committing a crime. It turns out the man, whose name is Josef, has traveled all the way from Germany to seek vengeance for his partner. This partner happens to be the same hunter that Goddard apprehended earlier, and the one who owns the silver stake believed to be the murder weapon. Aya reasons that Josef can't be the murderer, simply because he's traveling at the time of the incident, and the proof is his ticket and the soot on his elbow. She turns to the hunter and asks about his partner. Yosef says that he tried to dissuade Hugo, his partner, from his plans of attacking Goddard months before, but Hugo was confident he could pull off what he's prepared for. Using his special stake encased in leather and another reliable accomplice, Hugo was sure that he could make a statement against the so-called human allies. Yosef also adds that he's only here to avenge his partner, but it's clear that he's not exactly against the vampires. Aya asks Yosef again if he knows that the prepared stake was silver, to which he says he has no idea. With that, she lets the hunter go. She now has the final piece of the puzzle in this almost farcical yet tragic event. She orders the vampire to gather everyone in the study room so she can discuss the events of the murder and reveal the true culprit. After a few minutes, everyone involved is present. Aya starts her deduction show. She begins by saying that the culprit is indeed one of the members of the Goddard family. She goes back to the seven problems she detected after her initial study of the crime scene. First, it's strange that Lady Hannah didn't sense the intruder despite her vampire abilities. Second, it doesn't make sense that the attack happened at night when all the vampires are awake. Third, it's baffling why the bottle of holy water was left at the crime scene. Fourth, the culprit has obvious knowledge of the layout of the mansion and the schedule of its occupants. Fifth, it's strange why the stake was put back into the storage room. And now, she states the sixth problem, one of the most important ones in this case. Claude and Alfred's rooms are near Hannah's room, so they would have heard any sounds coming from it. But they didn't. So why is this so? Several explanations can be made. It could be that there were indeed suspicious sounds coming from the room, and that both Alfred and Claude lied about it, making them accomplices in the crime. But if they're indeed accomplices, then they should have made a strong alibi for each other. Since they don't have any, this angle is a moot point. Of course, it's also possible that either of them got the stake and committed the crime before 1am. But Goddard says that nothing was amiss in the warehouse at the said time. Another explanation could be that a pillow was used to muffle the sound. But the presence of the bloody cloak indicates that the suspect used it to protect himself from the blood splatter. From these considerations, it's safe to assume that the culprit used his bare hand to stab the stake into Hannah's chest. They could have heard hammering or tinkering, which would be normal since the lady used to fix antiques and furniture. But the only reason no sound was heard at the time was that the actual weapon used was not the silver stake, but rather a more fragile but still potent murder weapon. This leads to the seventh and final problem in this case relating to the bottle left at the crime scene. Everyone has assumed holy water was splashed on Hannah's body, and the bottle was the container used to do it. Yet its inside is dusty, which contradicts this assumption. However, holy water was indeed present on the victim's body. Why is this so? The only explanation is that the culprit used this as a red herring, to hide the true murder weapon. That the stake used to stab Lady Hannah was made of iced holy water. And so the sequence of events is like this. The culprit tricked an avenging vampire hunter like Hugo into believing he could end the existence of vampires. The silver stake and its leather case were needed to lay out the culprit's alibi and to put the blame on humans. Once the weapon was confiscated and put inside the storage room, the culprit filled the leather case with holy water and made an ice stake. Once it's done, he carried out the deed. 
The correct time of the murder was between 12.30 and 1 a.m. when there could be other possible suspects. He has enough strength to push the stake into Hannah's heart, and he knows that the lady would be in her room napping. After the deed, he collected some blood into another container, left the bloody coat and the dusty bottle to create the crime scene, then waited for Goddard to leave the storage room. Once the place was clear, he snapped the chains and locks and poured the vampire blood onto the silver stake to make it look like it was the weapon. But in the process, the culprit accidentally touched the silver stake. The wounds from it would take at least a week to heal, so he had no choice but to cut his fingers off using the swords in Hannah's room to hide the evidence. The swords were made of steel, which didn't harm vampires. Then he went out with his father, creating his alibi and completing his crime. Everyone is tense as the realization of who the culprit is hits them. But Aya doesn't need to say the name because the culprit inadvertently admits his crimes. Raoul jumps on Sugaru and tries to claw at his throat. The Oni Slayer simply kicks him out of the window, where the young vampire's family won't see what he's about to do to him. Raoul is against his family, becoming human allies. In his mind, their kind is superior. It makes no sense why they have to stoop to the level of weak humans. He thinks that if he creates a vampire murder scene and puts the blame on humans, then the latter will think twice about making them their allies, even at the cost of his own mother's life. But all this doesn't matter to Tsugaru. For him, it's more entertaining to think about how to end this misguided and arrogant young vampire. He doesn't prolong the fight. In one move, Tsugaru terminates Raoul. After this ordeal, Goddard is still trying to process the fact that his son did what he did. But the bottom line is that he'll uphold his wife's ideals, that is to maintain a good relationship with humans. One can only hope the family can be given time to grieve for their loss. Before leaving, Aya asks the vampire if he knows a skinny old man who uses a black cane that has the letter M engraved on it. Goddard says there was someone like that who visited him not so long ago. He was called the Professor and invited Goddard to join him in London, to which the latter refused. Slowly but surely, Aya Rindo gathers more clues about the man who took her body and the one who turned Sugaru into an Oni, but they need to continue their journey. As it happens, this same man is travelling the country roads along with some peculiar companions. Is he expecting Aya and Sugaru to come after him? His true intentions for now remain a mystery. After solving the murder case of the vampire lady Hannah Goddard, our trio known as the Cage Users continue their journey to London. This time, Aya Rindo, her maid Shizuku Hase, and Sugaru Shinuchi get involved in a highly anticipated heist orchestrated by the most skilled thief in the world. Starting this investigation, we start from the perspective of a man opening his eyes. By the way we see his vision dart everywhere, we can assume he's been taken against his will. This man's name is Eric, but he's better known as the famous Phantom of the Opera. And the one who took him is Arsene Lupin, a gentleman thief known for his impeccable disguises and smooth operations. Lupin needs Eric's help to pull off one of the greatest heists in London in 1899. He plans to steal the penultimate knight, owned by a man named Phileas Fogg. Eric is uncertain of this job offer because London is the territory of Sherlock Holmes, the eclectic detective. But Lupin is confident they can outwit him. It turns out it doesn't take much to convince Eric because in the end, he agrees to help Lupin in his quest. Meanwhile, the said detective is in a standoff with our protagonists, Aya, Tsugaru and Shizuku. Sherlock Holmes is ordering them to return the customer list from a cane shop. The trio has just stolen it to find a clue about the professor that they've been searching for a year. Before any fight ensues, one of the officers from Scotland Yard arrests all of them and puts them inside a prisoner transport carriage. As it happens, they're not the only ones inside the vehicle. A pair of twins sit there for an unknown crime. Aya and Sherlock have an informal deduction showdown to deduce what crime landed the twins there. They correctly guess that the twins were transporting heavy contraband porcelain art pieces. After this, they introduce themselves to each other. As usual, people who see Aya Rindo speaking are horrified, just like the twins. But Sherlock and his companion, Dr. Watson, instantly know that she's an immortal, the only one that's living in Japan. The officer that's with them, upon hearing their names, immediately looks back at his newspaper, where it's reported that Sherlock Holmes and another detective from the East were commissioned by Phileas Fogg to guard his treasure. At once, he understands that these are the detectives mentioned in the article and that they must proceed to Fogg's mansion instead of the prison. Upon arriving there, 
A few civilians are standing outside the mansion's gate, and numerous guards are already stationed inside. One of the civilians is Eric, who sees the arrival of the famous detectives who will be watching out for them. He returns to Lupin to report this development. In the mansion, the detectives are welcomed by the butler named Passepartout. Inspector Lestrade of Scotland Yard is also there. Right away, they are given the general layout of the mansion. Then they are led to another room to meet the man of the house. Phileas Fogg is an adventurer who went around the world with his butler years ago. He bought the mansion to house all the treasures he had collected during his journey, including his most prized possession, the penultimate knight. And then, days ago, he received a letter from Arsène Lupin, telling him that the gentleman thief will be stealing the gem along with its case on the night of January 19th, between 11pm and 11.30pm. Because of this threat, Phileas enlisted the help of 101 guards, plus the expertise of Sherlock Holmes and Aya Rindo. With him and his butler, there are 108 in total who will be watching over the gem. Then there will be three more joining them. One is a detective from the Paris Police Department. The other two will be from Royce's Advisory Security Department, namely Reinhold Stinghart and Fatima Double Darts. Royce's is a unique insurance company that's been in business for over 200 years. According to Lupin, they prioritise the hunting of monsters as much as protecting their clients' insured treasures. There are seven total members, all of them wearing white with a code name and agent number that corresponds to their strengths and are formidable enemies of monsters. Aya warns Tugaru to be careful of them. After this little introduction, Phileas leads them all underground to the room of residual sins where the gem is kept. The door of the room is massive, with intricate embossed designs of which some parts serve as the locks. There are three total locks on the door, and it can only be opened with the force of four men. Inside is a spacious, circular room with high ceilings. In the middle is a throne where the box that contains the gem sits. Phileas shows them all how to open the box, which looks complicated. Then he brings out a cloth to hold the gem. The penultimate knight is an 80-carat black diamond that's made up of carbon and europium. But the gem is not the only valuable thing in the room. The box that contains it is made from pure silver, making sure that no werewolves and vampires can touch it. Aya asks Phileas about how he came about the treasure. Phileas says he got it 20 years ago from a German friend who excavated it from a 14th century archaeological site. Phileas received it as a closed box, not knowing what was inside. It took him 10 years just to figure out how to unlock it. Once he did, he saw the gem and discovered that some words were engraved on it. Aya translates the words, The dawn is red as blood, the dusk is purple as the corpse. When the moon shines, please do not gaze at my ugliness because I harbour a wolf inside of me. Passepartout adds that there's a German legend about a tribe of dwarves that was destroyed by a tribe of werewolves. To avenge their annihilation, the remaining dwarves carved a gem that will point to the location of their destroyers, and they made its container dangerous for their enemies. Sherlock finally understands why Lupin is after the priceless gem. While he's studying the layout of the room, Aya is busy studying every aspect of this investigation. The room, the gem and its box, and all the people involved. In the end, Aya is confident there's a way to stop the thief from getting what he wants. But she also understands that her idea may be stupid. She gives Tsugaru a hint, Ishikawa Gomon, an infamous Japanese outlaw. The next afternoon, the trio takes a rest at a nearby park. It's the day of the supposed theft, and they decide to take a break before getting into action. Another birdcage covered in cloth sits on a bench next to them, its owner buying fish and chips from a nearby stall. Tsugaru also buys some snacks, leaving Aya and Shizuku. Aya tells her maid that she wants to see a famous exhibit of wax sculptures, so Shizuku leaves to check the availability of the said exhibit. Although it's not shown on screen, Tsugaru gets confused about which birdcage contains Aya's head. Understandably, he gets the wrong one. He and Shizuku only find out when they're on their way to Fogg's mansion. The parrot inside the cage croaks its learned words, startling Tsugaru, Shizuku and other passers-by. This mishap earns Tsugaru a black eye from the maid. So where is Aya? As predicted, the old man mistook her cage for his, and clearly he gets shocked to find a severed head inside instead of his pet bird. Because of this, he throws the cage away, flinging open its door and tossing Aya onto the road. Unfortunately, a carriage drives by, splitting Aya's head into two bloody parts. But she's immortal, so she won't easily pass away. 
although it's eerie to witness how she can put herself back together. To her distaste, the drivers of the carriage who run over her are the twins from yesterday. With evil grins, the twins capture Aya with the intent of selling her to the circus. While all this is happening, Dr. Watson goes to Baker Street to talk with Sherlock about their strategy for that night. To his surprise, Mycroft Holmes walks in and accuses his supposed brother of disguising himself. And it turns out it's true, because the real Sherlock Holmes walks in after his older brother. His disguise, now useless, Arsene Lupin pulls off his mask and greets the men amiably. Then he stands up and shows off his skills by unlocking a trinket box using a pin. He wants them to know that he's aware of the locks on the room where the treasure is, as well as the layout of the mansion. As for the silver box itself, Lupin is confident he can figure it out much shorter than Phileas did. All in all, he's showing Sherlock that his heist will be a success. With that, he jumps off the window, only to land on a carriage driven by Eric. Mycroft reflects on what happened and warns his brother to not underestimate the enemy. He reminds Sherlock that he should also look out for the representatives from Royce's insurance company. In the event that Lupin successfully steals the gem, the agents will go after him and take the gem forcefully for themselves. Knowing that these agents are prejudiced against monsters, Sherlock understands that they can decode the text on the gem and locate the werewolves to finish them. He takes note of this, but he's confident enough that he and the others can stop the heist now that he knows Lupin's moves. Meanwhile, Lupin and Eric continue driving when they almost hit a wandering maid. This maid is Shizuku, who's desperately looking for her mistress's birdcage. Lupin offers to help the maid find the birdcage. As they pass an intersection, another carriage speeds past them. Shizuku sees her mistress in the back seat of that vehicle, so she takes the wheel from Eric and drives after the perpetrators. In another location, Tsugaru sees the empty birdcage. Then a carriage speeds past him and he hears Aya scream his name. He follows this vehicle through the roofs. Eventually, he jumps onto it, making it crash on the sidewalk. He also ensures Aya is safe back in her cage. Shizuku runs to them and is relieved to know her mistress is safe. Then she tells her that two gentlemen helped in searching for her. Aya instinctively knows that these men are Lupin and the so-called Phantom of the Opera. Tsugaru gets the hint and taunts Lupin. A short fight ensues, in which Lupin gets the upper hand and knocks Tsugaru to the ground. Before leaving, Lupin warns Aya to stay away from his heist. Once they leave, Tsugaru drops the pretense of being defeated. It looks like he only taunted Lupin into a fight so Aya can observe how he moves, and with that they proceed to Fogg's mansion. They decide to station themselves on the top of one of the towers, leaving Sherlock and the rest in the room where the gem is kept. Except for the Royce agents who chose to stay on the upper floors, everyone is inside the room of residual sins. And with a signal from Inspector Lestrade, the guards lock them there. Everybody is tense as they wait for the appointed time. Less than an hour before 11pm, they receive a report about the stolen uniforms of the security guards. Thinking that Lupin may try to break in through the door using those uniforms, Sherlock decides to shoot the three keyholes. With that, they are now fully locked inside, but none of them expects Lupin's real plan. At 11pm sharp, they all feel rumbling from the outside. Without ado, a strong stream of water flows through the small vent from above. Phileas realizes that one of the towers was blown up, making a hole in the moat where water can flow toward them. Sherlock realizes he's fallen for Lupin's trap. They may have secured the gem inside the room, but they're ill-equipped to secure it underwater. As the room fills with water, one can only anticipate if the gentleman thief will be successful in this heist. Last time, we saw Sherlock Holmes and others try to protect the precious gem penultimate night from being stolen by Arsene Lupin. They have barricaded themselves inside the room, believing that they had outwitted the gentleman thief. However, we find out that it was actually them who were fooled. A strong torrent of water rushes inside from the only vent in the room, quickly flooding the chambers. All the gentlemen inside the room of residual sins try their best to cling to something before they get swept away by the rushing water. Phileas Fogg attempts to close the silver box, but the water is rapidly filling the room. Eventually, Holmes hears the sound of flowing water getting weaker, meaning that it's about to stop. At the same time, they hear loud bangs from outside the door. Fatima Double Darts has come to their rescue by destroying the locks. Due to pressure, the water destroys the door and flows freely into the canal beneath them. 
When the water has cleared, everyone can see that the chair where the box lays is now empty. Holmes checks the time. It's 11.30 p.m. It looks like Lupin is successful after all. They all return to the parlour where Fatima's companion, Reinhold Stinghart, is waiting. Everyone is wet and cold and dejected. But for Holmes, all is not yet lost. He approaches Inspector Ganimard and asks for handcuffs. Without warning, Holmes puts him down on the floor and puts the cuffs on him. Everyone is stunned by this action. Then they become shocked as Holmes reveals that this man is actually Lupin. Holmes shares with them his deduction about what happened tonight. First, Lupin showed up at his house to plant seeds of distraction. The showing of unlocking trinkets and pulling off masks had led Holmes to believe that these would be the same tactics he'd used to steal the gem. Lupin surprised them by engineering the water from the moat to flow into the room. This did not only distract them, but it also disguised the heavy rope that would be attached to the box. No human could fit into the vent, so Lupin made sure that his accomplice, Eric, would be the one to pull it out. Not only that, he made sure that his disguise would be perfect as Inspector Ganimard. That's why it didn't fall off when Holmes pulled the beard earlier. Lupin finally drops his mask. He's impressed by Holmes' deduction, but the question is, did he win tonight? Holmes reveals that Lupin has only managed to get the box. The gem inside is in a different place. In fact, it's inside Watson's cigarette case put in one of his jacket's pockets. Well, that just made it easier for Lupin. He manages to get it and then escapes the room using a smoke screen. As he runs along the rooftop, Eric in his soldier uniform makes sure that everyone is busy looking for Lupin before running himself. The two rendezvous at the greenhouse nearby. As Lupin admires the silver box that Eric holds, its door flies open. From inside, Ayarindo shouts for Shinuchi Tsugaru. Just like a bullet, he jumps down and retrieves the box, surprising the two thieves, while Shizuku Hase walks calmly toward her master. As it turns out, Aya has been hiding inside since that afternoon, relying on her instincts that doing so will lead them to Lupin and Eric. She has taken inspiration from the legend of pot heists in Japan that happened after the capture and execution of Ishikawa Gaimon. Aya has figured that Lupin would never suspect a human being to be inside the box, much less the head of an immortal. Eric makes a wise move by leaving Lupin there. Shizuku decides to follow him. After he leaves, Reinhold arrives to finally retrieve the gem himself. Lupin, Suguru and Reinhold are in a standoff when the ground suddenly shakes. From the shouts of men outside, they know that an explosion occurred, collapsing the bridge and trapping everyone inside the property. Lupin denies setting the bomb, which is not a lie because another group joins the party that night. The professor, the same man who took Aya's body and turned Sugaru into a monster, is now leading a group of assorted people. Upon entering the mansion, the group wastes no time cutting the guards into pieces or setting them on fire. The professor gives orders to his people to find Lupin and retrieve the diamond. Jack, the red-haired man, will take the east side, while he and Victor, the giant behind him, will search the west side. Alistair, an eccentric man, and Carmilla, a seductive lady, will serve as decoys for the police and guards. He also adds that they can take care of his so-called old friends if they happen to meet them. Sugaru and the rest don't know about this yet, as they're focused more on the gem. Lupin throws it outside the greenhouse and jumps out after it. Naturally, the other two men follow. This leaves Aya alone until the arrival of Holmes and Watson. The two inform her of what is happening. Aya has a shrewd idea of who the new arrivals are, so she convinces Holmes to take her. Her information may come in handy in case they encounter one of these people. Meanwhile, Eric is hiding inside a shed and is currently being hunted down by Fatima. Despite her small stature, Fatima is deadly with two crossbows in her hands. Soon, she shoots Eric in the back, but not fatally. He has no choice but to lure her closer and take her down. Inside the mansion, the lights have gone out thanks to the intruders, leaving only the fires from the burning bodies and furniture. Carmilla walks alone leisurely until she finds a maid hiding in a nook, shaking with fear. Carmilla is pleased to at least get a snack while working, so she crouches down and eases the maid's fear before biting her neck and draining her of blood. After finishing her snack, Carmilla continues her walk until she meets Inspector Lestrade. It's clear that the officer has no suitable weapon against the seductive vampire, and he would have been sliced into pieces if Shizuku hadn't arrived in time. Shizuku doesn't pay any notice to her as she's after Eric, but the vampire realises the maid is one of the professor's old friends, so she threatens to kill all of them. 
This finally gets Shizuku's attention and instructs Lestrade to get away. On the other side of the mansion, Alistair sets another guard on fire. This is his greeting to Lupin, Watson and Aya, who have just arrived there. Lupin recognises Alistair Crowley, a former researcher of magic and divination, who has influenced several cults into carrying out cruel rituals. But Alistair says he's not into it anymore as he's serving another group. And he looks at Aya, and is pleased to know that he gets the chance to kill one of Professor's old acquaintances. He's done talking with Holmes, so he flicks one of his poisonous needles at them. Holmes and Watson dodge, with the detective taking note of Alistair's nimble fingers. The criminal keeps on flicking needles at the two men and even flicks fire to light the room. Holmes and Watson's open fire at him, but he's too good at dodging bullets. Once the two men are in hiding, Alistair approaches Aya. He's so curious to see a talking head. He doesn't mind spilling to her his group's intentions. The professor wants the penultimate night because it can lead him to the mythical population of werewolves. As for Aya's body, he may have seen it at their base, but he's not sure. Holmes takes this opportunity to distract Alistair and charges at him head-on. With a cane, he hits the criminal's fingers, tossing the poisonous needle into Alistair's cheek. Instantly, he gets paralysed, but he has an antidote. Just as Holmes prepares to give the final hit, one wall suddenly blows up, revealing the professor. And Holmes can only gape at what he's seeing. It turns out, the professor is none other than Moriarty, Holmes's sworn enemy. They last saw each other years before, when Holmes was accosting Moriarty at Reichenbach Falls. Moriarty used to lead a crime organisation and was reported dead. But now Aya understands that this man and the one who took her body are the same because of the cane with the letter M carved on it. When Holmes asks why he's returned after eight years of silence, Moriarty says that he has new and better ideas. And it all started with what he calls his apprentice. Behind him, Victor appears and brings his boss a chair, signalling a lengthy narrative that will shed a general light on Moriarty and his intentions. The apprentice he's referring to is none other than Jack the Ripper, who is still wanted for the Whitechapel murders 11 years ago. He begged the professor if he could make him stronger, and Moriarty was more than interested in taking him on. They travelled to Japan, where both demons and the immortal reside. Moriarty aimed to combine the genes of these two creatures with a human to create a being with high intelligence, great physical strength and regenerative abilities. With the help of Jack, they managed to capture some demons just as the Great Demon Purge was about to end. Moriarty injected demon cells into several humans with robust bodies, including Jack, but the mutation was too strong to withstand. He also tried to recreate an immortal using Aya's body but he found out that the fundamentals were different than that of creating a human-demon hybrid. At this point, Aya reveals that she was indeed experimented on by a sick man 950 years ago, and that's how she became immortal. Moriarty continues his tale, saying that even if he wasn't able to create an immortal, he found out that the cells stabilised the demon cells inside Jack's body and made him immune to fatal mutations. To strengthen Jack, they travelled to the Carpathian region, captured a vampire and fused its cells into him. Holmes, Watson and Aya now realise why Moriarty is after the penultimate night. If he manages to capture a werewolf, then he'll be able to create a formidable chimera. And with the variety of monsters in his group, Moriarty will be invincible. To understand how strong Jack will be if he gets infused with werewolf cells, we need to know how strong he is currently. Tsugaru, Lupin and Reinhold are still fighting over the gem. Sugaru catches the gem with his mouth, but he spits it out after getting kicked by Reinhold. To shut him up, Lupin drops a grand piano on top of him. But this doesn't deter Reinhold. He lifts the piano in fury just as Fatima falls badly beside him. On the mezzanine area, Eric lands beside Lupin. Reinhold orders Fatima to retrieve the gem. But before she, or anyone for that matter, can move, another character jumps in. Jack's presence fills the place with a horrifying illusion, as if everyone is bathed in blood. He pockets the gem, then jumps at Fatima and slices her. Then he slaps Reinhold unconscious. Seeing all this, Lupin decides to retreat. There's no point getting caught between two monsters, and with that, the two flee away. Jack and Sugaru introduce themselves to each other. Then Sugaru attacks first. He cuts a sandbag in front of Jack and swipes at one of his pockets. Jack dodges. Sugaru removes his coat in preparation for a serious fight. The two regard each other, eyeing the markings on their body. There's a certain familiarity between them, a knowledge that they're both products of inhumane experiments. One has embraced it willingly, 
while the other reluctantly and belatedly so. The Red Oni and Blue Oni fight each other brutally, but because of Jack's vampire cells, he's more speedy and stronger than Sugaru, despite the latter's cunning fight skills. After throwing Sugaru into a wall, Jack sees no reason to end him. He lights a flare, signaling to others that the mission is done. The flare comes just in time, as Shizuka falls to the mercy of Carmilla. The maid is on par with the vampire, releasing one strong punch after another. But Carmilla strikes her in the end, biting Shizuka's hand. Her poison acts like an aphrodisiac, making Shizuka feel so erotic she can't think straight. Carmilla almost sexually pleasures her until the maid grabs a cross and stabs her with it. Carmilla is about to attack in retaliation when the flare lights up the night sky, prompting her to stop. Moriarty also sees this and prepares to leave. Before leaving, he informs Holmes, Watson and Aya of his name, The Banquet, and that they've won tonight. After the events, everyone who's still alive gathers at the parlour, dejected because of their failures. At Moriarty's base, everyone is anticipating, except for Carmilla, who can't get over Shizuku. The professor asks Jack to show them the penultimate night, but to their shocked disappointment, Jack's pocket is ripped. That's because Chugaru has managed to swipe at it earlier, snagging the gem and hiding it in his coat. Aya is pleased, especially since she has cracked the cipher engraved on it. When put against light, the europium in the gem casts a red glow. The words read Fangzan Wald, or Fang's Forest, the presumed location of the village of wolves. It seems like the next adventure for the cage users is already set. Aya Rindo, having deciphered the message engraved on the penultimate night, had uncovered a clue leading them to a mysterious location known as Fangzanewald, or Fang's Forest. The gem's owner, Phileas Fogg, allowed them to take it, understanding that it was the key to discovering a place that existed only in legends. Aya, accompanied by her loyal maid Shizuku and dedicated bodyguard Sugaru, walked along a secluded mountain path in southern Germany, heading towards a destination known as Willendorf, they were well aware of the peculiar task awaiting them there, to meet with real werewolves, creatures of myth and legend, before the enigmatic group known as the Banquet could achieve the same goal. Moriarty, their adversary, had made his intentions clear during their previous encounter, explaining that he required werewolf cells for his ambitious plan to create the ultimate chimera by injecting them into his apprentice, Jack. As they ventured deeper into the forest, Aya shared her past encounters with werewolves, harking back to an experience that had taken place 150 years ago. It was during a time when one of her associates had sought to determine which creatures possessed the capacity to slay an immortal being. Among the creatures brought for examination was a werewolf, confined within a cage. Despite their reputation for wildness and savagery, Aya revealed that werewolves were, in fact, highly intelligent beings. They could comprehend human language, possessed exceptional hiding abilities, and could seamlessly shift between three distinct forms, human, wolf, and a powerful beastman. The third form in particular was renowned for its formidable strength, enabling werewolves to grow to the size of bears, heightening their senses, and rendering their fur effectively bulletproof. While they were ferocious by nature, werewolves were also known for their reclusive tendencies, making it a considerable challenge for Aya and her companions to establish communication and navigate this unique encounter with these enigmatic creatures. As Aya, Shizuku and Suguru continued their walk through the forest towards their destination, their journey was suddenly interrupted by the appearance of a man approaching them. The man seemed to be calling out to someone, and upon spotting the trio, he greeted them with a friendly demeanour. However, he discreetly prepared his pistol behind his back, a subtle sign of caution. Tsugaru offered a warm greeting in response, and the man's suspicions were confirmed when he recognised the maid and the blue-haired individual holding a birdcage as none other than the infamous cage users. This timely encounter was coincidental, as the man explained that his village was in dire need of their assistance. The man introduced himself as Dr. Heinemann and informed them that a troubling case involving a missing girl awaited their attention. Leading them towards the village, the trio observed that the villagers were unaccustomed to the presence of outsiders, which could present a challenge in their forthcoming endeavours. Dr. Heinemann detailed the series of incidents that had shaken the village over the past year. It all began when the chief's granddaughter disappeared one fateful night after fetching water, and her lifeless body was discovered the following day, 
horribly mangled. Four months later, a woodcutter's daughter met a similar fate, with her body found burned and mutilated. Another four months passed, and a girl from a Miller family became the third victim, sharing the same grim fate as the previous two. Each incident occurred on a rainy night when the girls left their homes and the bodies were discovered days later in the forest. Disturbingly, all the bite marks on the victims matched, as confirmed by their grieving families. The most recent abduction occurred just the previous night, when a girl named Louise was kidnapped from her locked room on a rainless evening. Dr. Heinemann presented a hypothesis that these incidents might be connected to an event from eight years ago when villagers had hunted down a female werewolf and her daughter. Though those creatures had perished, the present-day villagers suspected that another werewolf was hiding among them, masquerading as one of their own. The shadow of fear and suspicion loomed over the village, casting a sinister pall over their current predicament. Upon their arrival at the village's church, the detectives found themselves amidst a heated dispute involving two villagers named Gustav and Knut. The quarrel centered around the abduction of Gustav's daughter, Louise. Dr. Heinemann intervenes, diffusing the tension and introducing the detectives to the villagers. As Aya made her presence known, it was as expected. Her unusual appearance initially shocked and horrified the villagers. However, she manages to calm their fears with her composed demeanor and assures them that she could unravel the mystery at hand. The trio was then escorted to Gustav's residence, where Louise's portrait was displayed. Louise, a frail girl confined to a wheelchair, rarely ventured outside and was always accompanied by her parents. The previous night, Louise had been tucked into her bed by her mother, who noticed nothing amiss as she locked one of the room's two windows. The other window was stuck, so she didn't investigate further. Shortly thereafter, they heard commotion from Louise's room, prompting Gustav to retrieve his shotgun. However, upon breaking the lock and entering the room, they discovered a scene of chaos, with Louise missing. Upon inspecting the room, the detectives observed signs of a struggle, with blood on the bed, but none elsewhere. Werewolf footprints were present, originating from the fireplace and leading toward the stuck window. Aya instructed Shizuku to drop an object down the chimney to gather clues regarding the intruder's entry. Surprisingly, there were no footprints on the roof. Strangely, nothing appeared to be missing from the room. Aya deduced that the room had been staged to make it appear as if there had been a struggle. Nevertheless, she was convinced that the culprit was the same individual, based on bite marks found on a book and the consistent procedure in previous cases. Shizuku also pointed out a damaged lock on a nearby shed, reportedly damaged during a robbery a year ago, around the time of the first incident. The detectives proceeded to interrogate the village chief, who shared historical information about the village's past encounters with these creatures. A century ago, these beasts would prey upon the village, consistently approaching from the base of a nearby waterfall. When Aya inquired whether these werewolves hailed from the legendary Fangs Forest, the village leader grew defensive and was hesitant to provide further details. Aya negotiated a deal, offering to solve Louise's abduction mystery in exchange for information on how to reach the mythical village. The village leader agreed, acknowledging the significance of the penultimate night as a key to locating it. When asked if he believed the werewolf culprit was hiding within the village, the chief expressed doubt. Most villagers were born there, and the potential suspects, if any, would likely be newcomers. He revealed that he had already conducted tests on three individuals, Heinemann, Knut, and a painter named Alma. To detect werewolves, he had subjected them to various sensory challenges, such as ringing bells and presenting fragrant flowers. Despite these trials, the three individuals had remained calm, leading the chief to believe they were ordinary humans. The village leader continues to provide valuable information about the strengths of werewolves, emphasizing their ability to manipulate their bloodline through their offspring, potentially creating more powerful descendants. This includes developing immunity against silver bullets and holy water, except when shot in human form, specifically inside the mouth or eyes. Legends spoke of a king of the werewolves who would be born through this method, a truly formidable creature if it were to exist. However, there was no concrete proof of its birth as of yet. The village leader drew upon his own experiences and the tales passed down, particularly his involvement in the events of eight years ago when they hunted a werewoman and her daughter. They had prepared silver bullets, but were surprised when the creatures showed no fear of their weapons. 
Ultimately, they decided to burn the silo where the creatures were hiding, showing no mercy even to the young girl inside. The detectives decided to focus their interrogation efforts on those newcomers to the village. Knut, the man accused by Gustav, was an engineer and had a detailed account of the werewolves from eight years ago. He shared that the villagers revered Louise because she was the one who had uncovered the presence of the wolves. However, the reason for the werewolves' initial presence remained a mystery. Five years prior to the incident, Knut had found a silver-haired woman named Rose abandoned in the forest. She was pregnant and severely injured. Initially, they believed she was a maid expelled due to illicit affairs. Knut took her in and, after a few months of recovery, she gave birth to a healthy girl named Yeti. Rose generally kept to herself and the occasional howls in the forest led them to believe she might have a connection to the wolves. One day, Rose mistakenly identified Louise as her daughter and whispered to her that if she smelled a fragrant flower, she must not reveal her ears. Louise's curiosity got the better of her, leading her to expose Jet to the flower, resulting in her transformation and triggering the events that led to the hunt, fire and apparent demise of mother and daughter. When questioned about the identity of the culprit, Knut claimed neither he nor Heinemann were responsible. However, he expressed suspicion regarding the painter Alma, who had depicted Louise's portrait, and those of the three previous werewolf victims. Alma was described as a woman in her mid-twenties with golden hair, known for wearing a coat splattered with paint. She claimed to hail from a family of artists and to have studied at an art academy. Alma also mentioned occasionally sighting a golden werewolf near her house, unaware if the villagers were aware of its presence as she lived on the outskirts of the village. Aya, as she had done before, asked for her insights on the culprit, to which Alma inquired whether Aya believed she was responsible. Aya refrained from making any direct accusations, but subtly exposed Alma's lies. She noted that Alma's manner of holding the charcoal pencil differed from someone who had attended an art academy, suggesting that she was a self-taught artist. Despite being caught in her lies, Alma remained composed and revealed that she had been abandoned at a young age, rendering her family and personal history unknown to her. She expressed her love for art and presented the charcoal sketch of Aya as a testament to her passion. The detectives thanked her for her cooperation before deciding to visit the river leading to the waterfall. As they approached the river, they observed its strong current and the thick mist forming near the waterfall, which made it difficult to see the bottom. The remnants of the burned silo also caught their attention. It was during this visit that Sugaru sensed a distant presence, raising suspicions that the banquet had arrived in the vicinity. The detectives make their way to Heinemann's house, where they intended to stay for the night. During their conversation, Heinemann shared a previous incident in which Louise had gone missing. On that occasion, her wheelchair had become stuck in the mud, rendering her unable to call for help. Fortunately, she was found later that night, safe and sound. Their discussion was suddenly interrupted by the arrival of two more unexpected guests. Rapid Shot Alice and Chaintail Kyle, the third and fourth agents from the Royce Consulting Security Department, had followed the lead provided by Holmes and joined the investigation. Tensions run high as Alice expresses a desire to eliminate Aya and her companions. However, Aya quickly briefs them on the ongoing case involving the werewolves, emphasising the potential opportunities for the agents to confront these creatures. Alice agrees to cooperate, albeit begrudgingly. Once the three were alone again, Aya provides Tsugaru with what she refers to as his regular supplements. Shizuku watched this interaction with silent jealousy. However, their intended restful night takes an unexpected turn when they hear shouts coming from Alma's house. Rushing to investigate, they arrive just in time to witness Alma's transformation into a golden beast woman, then into a smaller yet still formidable werewolf. Tsugaru engages in a fierce battle with the werewolf, discovering that it matched his strength. The agents and Shizuku attempt to shoot the creature, but find their efforts ineffective. At one point, the werewolf targets Aya, prompting Shizuku to prepare to shoot it in the eye. However, the creature swiftly dodges her shot. The werewolf succeeds in capturing Aya's cage and hurls it into the nearby waterfall. Shizuku leaps after it, managing to grab the cage, but ultimately falling into the mysterious mists below. 
From where we left off last time, we saw Shizuku falling into the mist below the waterfalls after saving her master Aya. To those who saw her fall, it's definite that she's already gone. But Aya thinks otherwise. A few minutes after this incident, Aya and Sugaru are inside the church with Dr. Heinemann treating Sugaru's bite marks. Alice and Kyle, both from the Royce Agency, have returned after doing a clean sweep of the place where the fighting happened. The golden werewolf that is the painter Alma is nowhere to be found. Aya addresses the village leader, who is also there, about their deal. She has uncovered the culprit who took away the lives of those innocent girls. Now he has to uphold his end of the deal. With no choice, the leader instructs them to stand in front of the burned silo and wait for the sunrise. They have to raise the gem to get a glimmer of the clue, with the part of the cipher facing the sun. Aya is satisfied with this, and as promised to the Royce representatives, she allows them to come with her and Tsugaru. They stand in front of the silo, and in a few minutes the sun is starting to rise. As they look ahead, they now understand why it's called the Fangs Forest. The mountains where the sun rises from create seemingly inverted shadows. These shadows meet the protruding rock formations from below. Altogether, they create an illusion of a wolf's fangs, thus the name Fangs Forest. With the clue from the gem, they now know the direction to take towards the village of werewolves. Below the mist, Shizuku is waking up. She's bewildered to realize she's naked. A girl, also naked, is sleeping on one of her sides, and a red wolf is on her other side. A curtain is moved aside, revealing another girl with golden hair. Her name is Nora, and she introduces her companions as Vera, the red wolf, and Kaya, the naked girl. Once they are all garbed in simple cloths, Nora explains to Shizuku where she is. She's in Wolfenheila, or the village of werewolves. Nora says she saw Shizuku floating along the stream and decided to rescue her. They have taken her clothes and her rifle and have hidden them. Werewolves are nocturnal and live alone in their respective huts. That's why no one has discovered Shizuku's presence there yet. Vera wonders if Shizuku is the culprit they've been looking for. Nora replies it's impossible since the gun they got from her is a rifle, while the culprit is known to have used a shotgun. Shizuku gets interested in this, so she asks about it. Nora says there have been a series of murder cases in their village starting from one year ago. It has taken three innocent lives so far, and it always happens during rainy nights. Shizuku gets a chill up her spine as the cases sound eerily familiar with the ones from Willendorf. When she tries to ask for more information, Nora refuses to talk and says Shizuku must go. The maid sees that the wolves are about to make some tea, so she offers to make it for them as thanks. The wolves like her blend. Nora decides to trust Shizuku with the details of the cases. The first victim was Romy, a 14-year-old girl. It happened one year ago on a rainy night. Her body was found in the forest with one shotgun wound on the head. Four months later, the next victim was the 11-year-old Aita, and then, four months later, the third victim was 15-year-old Clarissa. They had perished in the same way, with one shotgun wound, and their bodies found in the forest on a rainy night. The village protectors, called the Beast Gang, had tried their best to locate the perpetrator. But the problem was that the scent would always be cut off immediately, rendering any search useless. Shizuku feels for these young wolves as they could be the next victim. She assures them that once her master arrives, they will help in solving cases. But Nora says Shizuku must go before she gets discovered. And this time she's serious. She says she'll distract the Beast Gang by leading them to the west side of the forest, while Vera and Kaya will hide the maid inside a haystack and cart her towards the east. With the plan settled, Vera and Kaya start to pull the cart containing the haystack and Shizuku. Unfortunately, they run into some members of the protectors. The young wolves greet them cordially and attempt to move on, but one of the wheels comes off, unbalancing the cart and revealing Shizuku. Instantly, the protectors transform into wolves and chase her around the village. She's capable of protecting herself, but soon she gets surrounded by them. They tie her hands up and put her on top of a platform. This platform rests on a high pile of logs. She is interrogated by the village leader, Lady Reki. If she's not satisfied with the answers, she stomps her cane on the ground, and one pile is removed from the stack, making the platform unstable. The villagers are apprehensive since it's been years since they erected the platform, and it was someone named Rose who'd been on top. At first, Shizuku lies to save Vera and the others from getting involved with her, but Lady Reki sees through it. So Shizuku decides to tell the truth. 
that she came to the village by accident, and she never intended to hurt any of them despite carrying a gun. Vera and Kaya also help clarify the matters, that her gun is different from that of the perpetrator, and that her master is a detective who can help them solve the case. Before any of them can react, they all hear a gunshot coming from the west. It's as Shizuku feared. Nora is the fourth victim, her body lying on a flat stone. She asks if she can examine the body even with her hands remaining tied. Shizuku observes the crime scene. There's one gunshot wound to the chest. The clothing Nora wears is dry despite her body being wet. There's also little to no blood around, which is weird if one considers the possibility that the crime happened there. There are markings on a nearby tree indicating two shots have been fired, yet they only heard one. Quint, the Beast Gang leader, orders one of the members to sniff for any clues, but just like the previous cases, the smell ends there. Quint understands that Shizuku is not the perpetrator, but he's not trusting her anytime soon. As for Lady Reki, she's mourning because Nora is about to be turned into a Miko, but now she's gone. Meanwhile, Tsugaru, Aya, Alice and Kyle are traversing a steep pathway on the side of a cliff. Without warning, Victor from the criminal group The Banquet appears and kidnaps both Sugaru and Aya. But it turns out, the huge monster is simply doing the cage user a favor by separating them from Alice and Kyle. The Royce agents are a nuisance to their respective purposes, so it'll benefit both sides if they get rid of them. Of course, Sugaru and Aya must pay something in return. Sugaru gives Victor the gem and says that they could have arrived earlier than this. With that, the pair goes on their way. The village of werewolves conducts a burial rite for Nora. Shizuku is imprisoned, waiting faithfully for her master to arrive. Soon, Vera finally meets the blue-haired guy holding a birdcage that contains a human head. It never gets old how anyone gets shocked at seeing Aya, whether they're human or not. Vera leads them to the prison, where Aya checks on Shizuku's welfare and commends her on a job well done. Shizuku relays her observations and everything she's learned about the village. Aya knows that their time is limited, so she and Sugaru go ahead to the crime scene. Shizuku will have to wait a little longer inside her cell. They arrive there and walk for a few more paces until they reach a clearing. A small boulder is in the middle. It may look insignificant, but Aya sees this as another clue. It turns out she's right. It hides a path to the underground. The culprit uses this as a hiding place after dumping the victim's body in the forest. This explains why the scent gets cut off and the wolves have no idea about this passage. Further exploration shows that this has been inhabited by the culprit for a long time. They find a shotgun beside the bed, presumably the same one stolen from Gustav's shed a year ago. After seeing a pool of blood near an underground lake, Aya deduces that this is where Nora was shot. Then the culprit brought the body above the ground and made another shot to get the wolves' attention. This explains the bullet marks on the tree. They also see the word Bewarung, meaning probation, carved on the wall, along with a countdown of days. Lying on the ground, not far from them, is the lifeless body of Alma. The underground is filled with moths, which immediately smother Tsugaru and Aya. But these insects' flight has revealed another path. Surprisingly, it leads to a trap door located on the burned silo, where the werewolf Rose and her daughter Yetta were burned eight years ago. Then they see Dr. Heinemann, he informs them that Louise's body has been found. Yaya and Sugaru are led to it, where Gustav and his wife are already weeping for their daughter. Aya doesn't hesitate to reveal the parents' treatment of their daughter in the past. She assumes that the couple must have mistreated Louise due to her disability, as evidenced by the clean handles of the child's wheelchair. The incident where Louise first got lost was actually Gustav, and the wife abandoning the child to perish. That's when Yetta, Rose's daughter, found her. Aya also assumes that Louise must have thought of ways to survive, and showing herself as useful would ensure the village wouldn't abandon her again. Knowing Yet's true nature and revealing it to the villagers gave Louise that chance, but it also led to the werewolves' untimely deaths. With Louise's murder case now solved, the duo decides to return to Wolfenheiler, but they notice that someone has already made their way through the path. Unbeknownst to them, Alice and Kyle see them using the trapdoor. Without hesitation, the Royce agents call all the villagers to follow them in eradicating the wolf kind once and for all. Inside the village, the banquet members have already made their move, 
Carmilla goes ahead to gather the young girls for a little bit of snack inside the weaving hut. Kaya is one of the girls lured into her trap. Aya and Sugaru come back to save Shizuku. Aya orders Sugaru to deal with the three wolves already howling in the distance. And with the help of Vera, Aya and Shizuku make their way out. The villagers from Willendorf have reached Wolfenheiler, and it's turned into mayhem. With the help from their Royce agents, the humans are intent on killing any wolf in sight. Alistair also joins the fray, which puts the wolves at more disadvantage. On the other hand, Tsugaru easily handles the three wolves despite the creatures using their beast forms. Aya, Shizuku and Vera reach a graveyard that's far from the chaos of the village. Aya instructs her maid to go rescue Kaya. Left with Vera, she instructs the wolf to dig. What they see there, or don't see, confirms Aya's deduction. She's now ready to put an end to this farce of an investigation. Alice faces Alistair, feeling too enthusiastic about facing one of London's most wanted criminals. But she underestimates Alistair, who has a lot of tricks up his sleeves. He manages to con the Royce agent into thinking she got him. When her guard is down, Alistair pricks her with his paralyzing poison. Alice's partner, Kyle, is in no better form. Even though he's captured Victor and surrounded him in chains, Sugaru unexpectedly comes and helps the monster beat the Royce agent. After removing the chains, Victor returns the gem to Tsugaru. Then, the latter asks the monster about Aya's body. Victor tells him the body is still intact and is located at their London base. It's like the monster is inviting Tsugaru there for a final fight. With that, the two separate ways. Shizuku discovers Kaya inside the weaving hut, as well as Carmilla. The two have bad blood from their last encounter, fueling their fight this time. Carmilla acknowledges Shizuku's wariness from her poison. She tells the maid it's only effective the first time because the body develops an immunity to it. Whether it's true or not, Shizuku gives it her all and manages to shoot the vampire. In return, Carmilla weaves fabric around the maid, pulling in the maiden werewolves she took earlier. They're still alive, but they're under Carmilla's spell. The vampire says this is not their final fight and they'll see each other again. For now, she'll leave together with her companions, since they haven't found the so-called King of the Werewolves. Vera brings Aya to the weaving hut, and Tsugaru arrives there as well. Aya instructs Tsugaru to go back to the underground pass. Shizuku and Vera accompany her to the village to unveil the truth. When they get there, the humans have cornered the remaining werewolves at the center. The high platform is still there. Aya gets their attention before calling out the true culprit. Willendorf's Louise, who's also known as Wolfenheiler's Nora. A golden werewolf appears atop the platform, whose real name is Yetta, the young girl who's supposed to have perished eight years ago. To understand the crimes Yetta has committed, we need to go back to 13 years ago. A werewoman named Rose was put on trial. She was a Miko, who was pregnant at that time, and her sin was simply rejecting the traditions of her village. She found a way to escape to Willendorf, where Knut found her. There, she gave birth to her daughter, Yetta, and they lived peacefully for five years. Then the incident where Lucy revealed their true nature happened, leading to the hunting and burning of the werewolves. But Yetta survived because her mother showed her the underground pass that connects Willendorf to Wolfenheiler. The smaller skeleton that was found by Knut was of a fox. This effectively covered the truth that Yetta was alive. Yetta went back to Wolfenheiler with the new name, Nora. While bidding her time for revenge, she gathered information about the village that rejected her mother and the village that took her mother's life. No one questioned her presence because the wolves had always lived independently from each other. Once she had gathered enough information, she carried out her plan. A year and a half ago, she stole the shotgun from Gustav's shed and also kidnapped Louise. The villagers had said the two children looked very similar and Louise didn't always go out so no one suspected that the werewolf child they sentenced to death was posing as the revered, crippled child. It was easy for Yetta to do this because first, there was no contact whatsoever between the two villages. Second, the werewolves had opposite schedules from humans. And third, she could easily travel between the villages through the underground pass. Adding to this was the fact that Louise helped with Yetta's plan. She was tired of her parents and the villagers' treatment of her disability. Yetta wanted the two villages to annihilate each other, and Louise couldn't care less about them. To do this, Yetta would kidnap girls from both villages, end their lives in the underground pass, then bring them to the forest where the villagers can discover the bodies. She did these crimes during rainy nights to hide the fact that she erased their scents on the underground lake found there. 
she made sure to create a pattern, causing fear and suspicion in both villages. Yetta made sure the crippled child was comfortable in the cave while she committed the crimes. Louise's form of entertainment was counting the days until the plan was a success. When the right time came, Yetta erased Louise's trace by staging a kidnapping scenario. But there was a deviation in her plans, as that was also the day Aya and the others arrived at Willendorf. Aya, upon inspecting Lousy's room, immediately assumed the kidnapping was staged, based on the fact that the window was too small for a beastman to come out of. Next, Yetta made sure that the blame for all the crimes at Willendorf would fall on Alma. It's safe to say that Yetta abducted the painter, then posed as her and transformed in front of that villagers, sealing her reputation. Once Alma had done her part, she was immediately eliminated. The last step of the plan was to eliminate Nora, and to do that, she had to shoot Louise in the head and arrange her body to look like her. She even put some of her blood on the body to make it look real. The reason why no one from Wolfenheiler suspected her was because she committed the crime in the underground pass. Not only did it convince the werewolves that Nora had passed away, it also saved Shizuku from them. After that, she dug up Louise's body and brought it back to Willendorf. This gave her a chance to accidentally reveal the tunnel that connects the two villages. The rest of the story is as what Yetta has planned from the start. Pitting werewolves and humans into each other so they can end each other. Yetta, who's carefully listening to Aya's deduction, admits to everything the detective says. She addresses Vera and apologizes for involving them in her crimes. Then, ignoring Lady Reki's cries of remorse, she jumps and runs away. Lady Reki is willing to forgive Yetta because she believes the young girl is what they have been waiting for all along. The ultimate creature known to be the king of werewolves. Upon hearing this, Aya realizes that a part of her deduction is wrong. Yetta proceeds to the underground pass where Tsugaru is already waiting for her. She is aware that she could be the king, but she doesn't know if it's true. When Sugaru doesn't let her pass, she fights him in the dark. But the Oni Slayer is clever. By punching Yetta into the lake, the werewolf gets wet and is forced to shake the water out of her body. This allows Sugaru to know her precise location and chain her. Just then, Aya and Shizuku arrive. Aya apologizes to Yetta for her wrong conclusions. She initially thought Yetta was out for revenge, but the truth is that she was only saving the three werewolf girls from being a Miko. She's saving them from becoming tools for breeding, which initially was the reason why her mother was banished from the village. So she kidnapped three humans and disfigured them thoroughly to create the illusion of the werewolf's death. Yetta doesn't deny this, for this is her true motive. Aya lets the young werewolf go. This is the least she can do for Yetta, who is better off discovering the world rather than being trapped in their village. This concludes the cage user's investigation of the Fang's forest. Aya believes nothing will change between the humans and werewolves, even though she did her best to teach both sides a lesson. Sugaru informs her about Victor's information on her body and its location, so it's guaranteed where they'll go next. Before leaving, Sugaru shouts at the top of his lungs, his voice resonating with the key figures in their journey. Thank you so much for watching. See you in the next video.